Welcome to the Leap to Success Innovation Breakthrough Forum 2016. My name is Avril Parkin, and I'm one of your MCs for today. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jamil McClintock, and I will be your co-host for today. Um, during the weeks, and unfortunately also during the weekends, I am a corporate attorney at DLA Piper um, when I'm not hosting great events as such. It's an honor to be here, and it's an honor to participate in the Cooperatives of Innovative Intellectuals inaugural event. If you do not know about the organization, it's a charitable organization charged and committed to driving innovation here in Hong Kong. So it is our hope that today you are not only entertained, you do not only become informed, but that you also are inspired to go out and take this charge on and to help foster an innovative community here in Hong Kong. Um, in order to do that, we have titans in the field here to inform, entertain, and inspire you. And before we can get into it, a uh, little bit of housekeeping. At this point, we would like to encourage you all to turn your phones to vibrate or silent. Uh, I made sure to do that to mine as well, so that would be embarrassing. Um, we do not encourage you, though, to turn them off, because during a few of the presentations, we will have a Q&A session. And what we will have you do, if you can use your network or sign into the Wi-Fi here at the convention center, if I could get the prompt um, to have you, uh, when you sign on, you can go to sledo.com. Uh, and during the presentations, we'll prompt you when it is a Q&A session. Please enter your questions while that presentation is happening. And you'll get a prompt that you can also enter your names. So if you enter your name and toward, at the end of the program, we'll have a prize for the three most pertinent questions that contribute to the conversation the best. Um, I can tell you from the information I have, it's not one, but two bottles of wine, and it's, it's very fine wine at that. So we will announce the, the winners at the end of the program, and you can come and collect your prize. So um, we, we will also give this prompt and, and inform you during the presentations when there will be a Q&A session. So without any further ado, I would like to invite the man that has played no small part in this program, uh, the chairman of the Cooperatives and Innovative Intellectuals uh, Group. He's also the chairman of Excel Capital Strategy Limited, another other than Mr. Ian Huang. So Ian started his career designing robots. He managed the invention of FDDI and the Hughes Network System. He founded XNet Technology, which then went on to be publicly listed. He has a master's in computer science from Carnegie Mellon. He has a master's in electrical engineering and has completed com advanced management program at Harvard University. Please put your hands together and welcome Ian Huang. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, welcome uh, to our second uh, innovation and breakthrough uh, forum. So, uh, all right, uh, I'd like to welcome first this, uh, our principal guest of honor, Mr. Nicholas Yang. And also, Dr. K. L. Chen. Uh, he is uh, sitting over there. He's uh, a space scientist, and he was deeply involved with the uh, Xiang'o Lunar Program of China. And Dr. Yok Liu uh, in Hong Kong, who doesn't know Dr. Yok Liu? He, uh, he is actually, that I know of, the first professor went into become an entrepreneur and take a company to full board listing, not, not, there no German in those days. Uh, and he was also the former chairman of the Hong Kong Council of Academic Accreditations. And last but not least is Dr. Mo Huang, of the pride of uh, Hong Kong Chinese. Uh, he has been with NASA, uh, JPL, for many years. Uh, the Saturn, 
and the Mars missions, he was responsible for their orbit, uh, the orbit technology and the, and the program. And then I want to thank you to our co-sponsors. First is the, uh, the uh, Innovation and Technology Commission. They have uh, all, all, no, uh, all of them have contributed an Ultra One Technologies, and Mr. Paul Jiang, and Wang YK, and myself. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, Daoshun Foundation, DLA Piper, and Eagle IP, and they all have contributed significantly in this program. Now, I just want to be proud to share with all of you our VIP, some of our VIP are here. Uh, Mr. Andy, Andy Bin, he's here. Uh, <laughs> Professor David Jiang, over there. Uh, Mr. Duncan Chu, oh, it's not here. Okay, he's coming in this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Raymond Ho, and I saw one here. Uh, Mr. Jason Chu. Uh, uh, Steve Hui is supposed to be here. He, he sent me two emails confirming that, but I haven't seen him yet. Uh, Professor Sun Kwok. Uh, Mr. Brandon Lee. Okay. Uh, Michael Lang and uh, Dr. William Lowe. Uh, I saw him here. Oh, where, where is he? Uh, Dr. Samson Tam and our principal, Tam. Uh, Alan Tong. Professor Pong. Uh, Mr. Simon Wong uh, and Peter, uh, Peter Yam. If I missed anybody, I must apologize because the reflection, you know, the, it's, it's blinding my eyes in here. Okay, uh, what I'd like to achieve in this uh, event is to like to ignite the thinking of leapfrogging. Because uh, we always talk about innovation, but how to do it. And then there's one other important thing for the entrepreneurs, how do you negotiate with the early round in investments? Uh, if you don't do it well, you actually kill the opportunity of the following round, the Series C and Series D. That's why in Hong Kong, hardly you can find any Series C and Series D uh, investments. And that is, so that's why it, it falls off the cliff. Okay, and then gain knowledge to identify and manage innovations. The last but not least, and this is a very important subject, is when you have the startup, do you grow fast? or grow slow. Now talk about us a little bit, introduce us. We are a chari charity or organization established last year, December 17th, and we are apolitical. We owe no, polit uh, no political favor and no commercial favors. Uh, we, are, we only want to do innovations. And we have two unique quality. One is that we value innovators with track records, and this is a big difference. Only the track record experience, in, in my opinion, is meaningful and con consequential. And the other is diversity. Uh, diversity is only one can give you f refresh and fresh ideas and actions. Our advisors, uh, Dr. Raymond Ho, he's here, and Dr. Yok Liu, he's here too. I don't see him there, but take my word for it, they are here. <laughs> and some of our distinguished affiliates, uh, Dilip, George, both of them are not here, uh, Professor David Jiang, uh, Mr. H.L., 
Jiang, uh, Professor Sun Kwok, uh, Steve Hoy, Michael Leung, Samson Tam, and Professor Pong, as well as Peter Yam. Now, this is a coming attraction. We will have one in, on March 25th in Shanghai, co-organizing with the Shanghai Association for Science and Technology. This is a done deal. It's just the agreement is done. It's just a matter of uh, they are organizing it. We are inviting speakers. And our speakers you know, uh, are have, have committed to attending this event. All right, thank you for coming, and hope I can uh, work together with you in today and also in the future. Thank you again. Thank you, Ian. We now have our keynote speech from the Honorable Nicholas Yang, the Secretary for Innovation and Technology from the government of the Hong Kong SAR. Nicholas has a Master's of Science and a Master's of Business Administration. He started his career working for Intel Corporation back in 1978, when I was just two years old. Please welcome to stage the Honorable Nicholas Yang. Uh, good morning. Uh, I found the first challenge. I have to leapfrog today. Uh, I need a third hand, otherwise I cannot uh, read from this uh, notes. Uh, but that's okay. I figure out how to do that. Okay, so so I'm gonna try it, and this is the first time I'm doing it. Okay, so I do. I, I will not have a third hand. Don't worry. I will not mutate in front of you. Um, but uh, it's good to be here, and uh, I, I do know that I'm associated with the other honorary uh, honor guests here. Uh, York is my uh, schoolmate at Caltech, and I just noticed uh, Mr. Wong here. He works on Saturn and Mars mission, and I work on the Voyager missions while I was JPL. So that was a long time ago, so don't give my age away. Um, Ian, distinguished guests, friends, ladies and gentlemen, okay, I, it is a great honor and pleasure to join you all here today at this forum. And then I, ha I, I have the opportunity to share some of my personal thoughts after taking office at the Innovation and Tec Technology Bureau for just about a year. Now to start with, uh, I'd like to uh, share with you some information. According to McKinsey and Company, the average company lifespan on the S&P 500 index has decreased by 83% from 90 years back in 1935 to less than 15 years in 2015. Now it is expected that about 50% of today's S&P 500 companies will have left the index within the next 15 years. Now, we have seen dramatic and eye-opening changes in business over the past decades. Now, not to mention uh, music publishing. I was talking about people about media, travel services, e-commerce. Disruptions are expected to hit the financial, medical, and education sectors in the future. And there will be no exceptions. And innovation, uh, and that's very unfortunate, but we have to face it. Innovation can lead to a substantial improvement or disruption in technology or business operations. Today, the capability to innovate, not just once, but again and again, is the key to the survival in a globalized, internet-driven economy. As some people, I know Jason will agree with this, you innovate or die. So Hong Kong has enjoyed an innovation run, whether you know or not, that most people do not know, but will make the other critics envious. Now, I understand people heard this. We do have a well-established legal infrastructure and our world-class ICT infrastructure to facilitate the flows of talents, idea, and knowledge. Our business community is trusted, and this trust is, is an advantage that Hong Kong will have for another 10 years at least around the world. Our financial services sector is one of the most competitive in the world. Now, our city management system is also among the best in the world because 90% of the Hong Kong people use public transportation system. And if you heard Fred Ma, he said, 
MTR now handles 5.5 riderships per day, and it runs 99.9% .9 on time. I understand people complain about MTR if it's 10 minutes or later, uh, late or more, but this is the kind of statistic we're running today. 95% of the Hong Kong residents uses public health care system, which has an operating cost among the lowest in the world. Oh, by the way, our MTR operates quite profitably, which is extremely rare for public transportation services around the world. Hong Kong also has the largest tier four data center cluster in Asia, ex Japan. I guess not many people know that. Because our electricity supply has, is not only has reasonably in cost, but also we have a high reliability, 99.999% reliable. A 5.9 reliability, which is not achievable in all the other Asian region today. Some people wonder about the incredible leverage Hong Kong has achieved. In 2015, Hong Kong handled 59 million visitors, which is more than eight times our popula population. The total market value of all the stock on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange equals to about 13 times Hong Kong GDP. There's no other stock exchange in the world that can even close. In short, Hong Kong's core strength is in the good execution of fundamental. I want to tell people that. And that itself is innovative. If you cannot execute well, it doesn't matter how smart you are. Now, over the past de few decades, okay, uh, five or six decades, Hong Kong faced at least two major daunting challenges. But we managed to overcome them with great flares and colors. For those old enough, 67, we had a, a bloody riot on the streets. But yet, in less than 10 years, we emerge as one of Asia's four little dragons in terms of economic achievements. Okay, we became the number one in making Christmas trees, in toys, or some of the electrical appliances. Okay, I'm talking about plastic Christmas tree, okay, not the real one. <laughs> so back then, if you look at it, the manufacturing sector accounted for almost 30% of Hong Kong GDP and higher for about 40% of our total workforce. In the 1980s, after mainland China started the economic reform, another huge challenge hit Hong Kong. With the low-cost labor and favorable policies, the Pearl River Delta sucked away Hong Kong's lifeblood in manufacturing. The once thriving manufacturing sector of Hong Kong in the 70s all migrated across the border leaving hundreds of thousands of workers in the manufacturing sector without a job and probably without a future. But in less than 10 years, Hong Kong re-emerged again by transforming itself into a service economy. Today, over 93% of our workforce okay, are in the service business. This covers financial services, trading and logistics, professional service, and tourism. All of these account for more than 50% of our GDP today. Now, on the other hand, if you look at Hong Kong's GDP as a percentage of mainland China's GDP, we have fallen from about 19% in 1997 to just about 2% in 2015. At the current rate of decline, Hong Kong's GDP will be significantly less than 1% of mainland China's GDP by 2025. That's mind-boggling. And that's startling. But are we increasingly becoming insignificant and irrelevant? I don't think so, no. We should not let such manipulative statistics trick us into pessimism about Hong Kong. While many locals have yet to realize this, the Hong Kong startup scene is gathering steam. Just look at the big names. This year alone, Hong Kong has attracted many major innovation startup events such as West Summit Rise, Elevator World Tour. In July, Sequoia Capital partnered with our university to launch the Hong Kong X Tech technology startup platform. And last month, Facebook teamed up with four local partners to launch FB Start. WeWork from the United States just expanded its, server, its presence to Hong Kong with two huge 
new office locations, new locations. Why? Because people see opportunities in Hong Kong. Now, according to Invest Hong Kong's latest survey, Hong Kong saw a steady upward trend in the number of startups during the past five years. Today, there are about 2,000 startups in innovation and technology in Hong Kong. About half of them are started by overseas entrepreneurs who came to Hong Kong to innovate. The number of co-working spaces, incubator, accelerator, reaches almost 50, a vast majority of which are run privately. Hong Kong continues to be unparalleled in terms of fundamental business advantages and market access to the mainland markets. Now again, I understand the SMEs are fading, facing a lot of challenges, but it is the fundamental that really has been driving Hong Kong. Now earlier this week, I was invited to Accenture's 2016 FinTech Innovation Lab, Asia Pacific Investment Day, Investor Day at Cyberport. Now this accelerated program is in its third year at Cyberport. I was amazed to learn that the 20 or so alumni already raised 40 million US dollars from the investor. This is FinTech, just FinTech alone. These are real numbers, I was shocked by this number. In addition, local startups have successfully using Hong Kong to expand their business globally. You may recall that one of our most successful local startup called GoGoVan has already connected users with more than 70,000 vehicles across Hong Kong, Singapore, South Korea, China, and Taiwan. It has planned to launch in Australia in the near future. Since its launch in 2013, this startup has processed more than 100 million US dollars in total transaction. Okay, but people don't talk about it. This is our success. Okay, now since the Innovation and Technology Bureau was set up just about a year ago, we have secured an unprecedented amount of 18 billion Hong Kong dollars in just four months' time. Okay, we ran through the filibusters of LegCo to help building a more vibrant and robust ecosystem in Hong Kong. That is our goal. Without the ecosystem, things will not continue. Okay. I'd like to highlight a few funding schemes. First of all, a two billion Hong Kong dollar injected into the so-called midstream research program for our local university. This midstream program encourage our university to, to conduct more interdisciplinary and translational R&D work, which are midstream or downstream in nature. With this added incentive, we hope to take our world-class R&D research expertise from our university labs to commercialization. Now we need the academia to work in tandem with the government to do that because we do have world-class research capability. Another two billion Hong Kong dollar innovation technology venture fund will, be, will fill a gap in the series A or pre-series A funding stage. I know Ian's talking about series C and D, but we gotta help the entrepreneurs at the series A or pre-series A stage. What we want to do is to co-invest with the venture capitalists on a matching basis in local innovation and technology startup. By bringing in world-class venture capitalists to Hong Kong, we can leverage on their experience and networks to help our local startup to scale up. This is very important. If they don't walk across the valley of death, they will not be able to reach the other end. In addition to our existing incubation, incubation program and funding support, Cyberport has launched a 200 million Hong Kong dollars Cyberport Macro Fund to provide seed funding and up to Series A funding to Cyberport startup, and that's already started. What is more, Cyberport has doubled its incubation scheme quotas and it will set up new clusters on FinTech and e-commerce. Now please recall that and mention the Accenture FinTech Accelerator at Cyberport earlier. Anyway, we know the right policy push and the joint efforts of the government, the industry, academia, and research sector are equally important. Together, we can build a robust ecosystem for spurring innovation and nurturing startups to, deli to deliver results on a sustainable basis. So let's work together and make things happen. Last but not least, I wish you all a most fruitful and imaginative conference. I understand you guys are the innovators. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, please stay on stage. I would like to welcome back Ian to the stage to provide a certificate of appreciation. For our next keynote speech on space uh, purview into space commercialization, uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Quing Lam Chan. He has a BA uh, in physics from Cal Berkeley, PhD from Princeton. He has worked for the who's who of research centers, including the Thomas J. Watson Research Center for IBM, the Goodard Space Flight Center, NASA, and most recently the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He has distinguished himself as an expert in astrophysics, fluid dynamics, numerical simulation, among many other things. He's a pioneer among his peers. He's received several awards and recognition for his expertise. So would you all please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Chan. Good morning, the honorable guest, uh, chairman. Uh, it's very nice to be here, uh, seeing all these uh, great people, you know, um, doing uh, inventions, uh, trying to build up the new businesses. Uh, I'm a scientist. I'm not really a. Uh, I'm not. Period. A, a, an entrepreneur. Uh, I cannot uh, offer you a method to uh, create uh, new companies, but I hope I can uh, get you excited in, uh, about the possibilities or the opportunities of uh, uh, particip participating in some space uh, 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 ventures. Uh, okay. Uh, my uh, talk will be on space commercialization, which is basically a, a review of uh, what has been uh, done in the market. Uh, as you know, space is expensive. Uh, it's not so easy to really get into uh, get into the uh, you know working on it, especially commercially. But uh, people have done it. Uh, how come it's not uh, moving? Okay. It's not. Let's see how. There's some, something, said some problem here. Anyway, all right. Basically, there are different uh, possible private ventures uh, has already been uh, taking place. Uh, I have categorized it into uh, three parts. Uh, the three main parts are the launching, launching capability, which is big deal. I mean, this is fundamental. If you cannot do it, forget it. Uh, the other is uh, uh, util utilization of uh, uh, resources in space, which uh, includes, uh, which is not listed here, uh, which includes uh, usage of uh, solar power from space, uh, converted into microwave and delivered to Earth, and of course, also uh, people are talking about mining in asteroids and the moon. And uh, what's shown here is just the first part. Oh no, this is the last part already. The last part is uh, space application, which includes many things, uh, including, uh, let's see, uh, of course, uh, uh, global network satellite systems like the GPS. In China, they have the Beidou. Uh, there's also a, a uh, Russian system. We are using it already. Uh, space tourism, that's something in the future. Probably not too far, though. Maybe, I would say, five to ten years. People are already flying in uh, suborbital uh, uh, you know, excursions. Uh, manu manufacturing sp in space, that's uh, something also uh, farther away. But uh, what uh, people have been doing now in terms of space, actually people have been doing quite a bit of uh, space uh, application 
in particular, uh, like telecommunication. That has been done for at least 30 years, 30, 40 years. So, uh, and we are going to mention some of these, uh, or can give you some example of uh, these uh, uh, ventures. And so you have a, an overall view. I mean, uh, I will not have time to get really deep into the de details. Okay, let's see what, how's the next. Okay, first I'm going to talk about the launching business, uh, the rockets, the main thing. Come on, move it. Should I f face it? This one. Okay, of course, the most famous uh, company is uh, SpaceX, which is uh, standing for uh, Space Exploration Technology Corporation. It's an American aerospace manufacturer uh, and a space transport service headquartered in California, United States. It was founded in 2002 by uh, Tesla Motors uh, CEO and former uh, PayPal entrepreneur Elon Musk with the goal of creating the technology to uh, reduce space transport cost and enable the colonization of Mars eventually. Uh, that's uh, Falcon 1 they, uh, in launching. Uh, it has already uh, docked on uh, the uh, International Space Station a few times. And this shows its recent achievement, which is the recovery of the uh, first stage uh, on sea, uh, just recently in April of uh, uh, 2016. Uh, this is a means to uh, reduce the, the uh, launching cost. Basically, if you make something reusable, then you save. They are talking about 30%, okay? The hope is eventually to uh, the talk, at least what they talk, to reduce the uh, cost of uh, uh, going to low Earth orbit uh, by a factor of oh, almost 10. I mean, to uh, 1,000 US dollars per kilogram, uh, per pound, not kilogram. <laughs> that makes the factor of two difference. Okay, uh, and also they are doing, uh, this is, uh, is this, let's see, all right. I think the point that cannot be seen from far. Anyway, up there, there's this Dragon 2 spacecraft, which is going to, pardon me? Point to this one? There? Really? <laughs> Forget it, doesn't matter. Uh, the, oops. Let's go back. This is a spacecraft to, for, to carry uh, human beings, and uh, it's going to uh, be uh, flown, uh, presumably next year, uh, to the uh, International Space Station. Well, actually recently, because of the uh, popularization of mini satellites and micro satellites and uh, nano satellites, cube sets, for example, uh, the way to develop the fast, uh, lightweight rocket, inexpensive rockets, very, uh, becomes a very important and urgent task. And I'm giving two examples here. One is uh, uh, this launcher one um, uh, made by uh, Virgin Galactic, which can uh, deliver uh, 200 pounds, 200 kilograms to space in, uh, Let's see, uh, US dollars one, well, 10 million, okay? So that's about uh, 5,000 US dollars per kilogram, okay? So that's, it's already better than the uh, 10,000 uh, US dollars per kilogram. Currently now, you know, you need to pay for uh, big rockets. But it's going to be launched by a, from aircraft. And uh, China is actually, uh, Doing this also very fast. This is a uh, solid rocket, solid booster, uh, solid uh, fueled uh, rocket. It can deliver 300 pounds, uh, 300 km kilograms in space really fast. And they are talking about a cost of uh, uh, 2,000 US dollars per kilogram. Okay. And 
This is the military version called Kwai Zhou. There is a civilian version, uh, civilian version, which is called uh, uh, Chen, um, let's see, um, Changzheng 11. And the two are basically the same thing. So, uh, so China is doing this very fast now. Now, uh, concerning the satellites, there has been many, many the companies doing that. Of course, they, among them, the longest the one that has a long history of building small satellites is this uh, Surrey Satellite Technology Limited. It's a British, as you can see from the flag there, company. <coughs> uh, in, already in 2000, it has already built a, a satellite for, uh, with Tsinghua University. It's a very small one, it's a, a mini satellite. Uh, and it has been launched successfully, it worked for uh, almost three years, and uh, it's been very successful. The, uh, recently, they launched the, uh, well, that's in 2015, they launched the DNC constellation when you have multiple uh, satellites, they call it a constellation, okay? It's like they're flying in constellation, several. And uh, the purpose is to, to uh, look for changes on the ground as well as to monitor disasters and to respond to disasters, okay? Which is very important for China nowadays, uh, actually. It's a, in, an important application in China. And actually, uh, a company in Beijing, uh, called the 20th century, uh, 21st century aerospace technology company uh, limited, have already leased 100% of the image uh, capacity of these three satellites. Okay. Now, this is the uh, so satellite situation. Now, concerning other kind of uh, like. Uh, well, in space, there's another thing. People are working on uh, space uh, tourism, right? You need to build cheap uh, habitats for tourists to stay in. This is uh, a, uh, a test, an experiment done by Bichiro. Uh It's called uh, BEAM, Bichiro Expandable Activity Module, which has been la launched uh, earlier this year and attached to the International Space Station, and it works. It is an, an expandable because when before, you know, it's attached, it's collapsed. It's a, it's a, you know, and then when it arrives, it, you feel in the pressure, it expands. But uh, it's actually uh, they're testing for safety. But uh, this is a very important factor, of course. Where in space you will be kept bombarded by uh, micro uh, meteorites, you know, uh, high-energy protons, high-energy particles. And actually, you know, even though it's expandable, okay, movable, uh, has a movable shell, actually the, uh, the thickness of this is over half a meter. Okay, so. Uh, Okay, this is something the uh, Bichilo plans to develop for uh, tourists. Okay, so someday you may, you know, <laughs> go go over there, up there, and stay there <laughs> for a while. Now, resource re utilization. Okay, that's a big. Of course, when you develop all these uh, machineries, you know, you need to do something. That's a purpose. Going to space is not just wasting money. Okay, one of that is that uh, uh, to uh, trying to um, mine from asteroids. Actually, I was surprised to find an asteroid that's so close to Earth orbit. <laughs> you know, uh, they are, this company, uh, Planetary Resources, uh, uh, actually listed a number of asteroids which has orbit close to Earth. Of course, you don't want to go to this asteroid belt, which is very far away from Earth, I mean, you want to go to some asteroids that's closer to Earth so that you can reach there early, uh, fast, and easy. And then you can see there, there you know, such kind of asteroid exists. And, uh, 
But of course, right now, this company uh, has no mining to do. What it does now is this uh, satellite is using for uh, Earth observing. So instead of going there to look at minerals, it looked at, it's looking at minerals on Earth. OK, now, the, uh, this is a, uh, an image of, uh, of course, a drawing of uh, an entry uh, what, which won the uh, uh, Sun Satellite Design Competition, first place, uh, of a project from the China Academy of Space Technology. OK. This design was to uh, uh, actually to convert sunlight into microwave power and then deliver to, uh, to Earth. Now, the, of course, oh, actually, let me point there. The, the big the array there uh, is, of course, to absorb sunlight and then convert to uh, uh, electricity, energy, and then this dish there is for transmitting the microwave. The uh, footprint of the microwave transmission would be something like a few uh, tens of kilometers. So this, it's going to eat up a lot of space. But the, uh, concerning the visibility, uh, there has been as established that uh, you can uh, transfer microwave quite a distance. Basically, people have tested it for uh, a distance of uh, 100 kilometer uh, near the ground level. So for going up to space, that's no, no problem in, in principle. But the problem, the big problem, is that uh, so far people have been doing it for uh, tens of kilowatts, which is very small compared to mega, mega, many, many megawatts which you, that you need. So people are now still trying to understand how actually how much was the limit of uh, power transmission. But if this can be done, this will really be a very, uh, uh, possibly a quick way to really get the uh, soft uh, part of our uh, energy problem because I bet this uh, may, might be easier to, to get the fusion working. Even though with fusion, work, fusion research, of course, is still being uh, conducted. So this is the idea. Sunshine on, well, this is not the same design. This is a different one. But uh, sun shining from uh, near the horizon on these two panels and then convert and deliver uh, the uh, microwave back to Earth. Actually, Japan is doing, uh, making this big, they want to put some, put a very big uh, array around the moon, all around the moon, <laughs> the hundreds of kilometers in area, uh, hundreds of kilometers square in area on the moon and deliver to Earth. That's what they're talking about. But of course, you need the technology to land and stay on the moon before you can do it. Okay, space application is something more reasonable, which is actually closer to Earth, uh, in, at least in terms of, you know, getting into uh, creating business. Uh, it's more realistic for, uh, you know, for a smaller investment or to, for startups. And I wish to stand, uh, spend more time on that. Now, uh, this is the oldest application, space application in Hong Kong. There's one. Uh, the main headquarters in Taipo, and you can see all these receivers. Uh, there's also a, uh, an array of uh, receivers in, at Stanley. And this company has been there for 30 years already. And sending up uh, communication satellites mainly. Uh, Asia Sat 9 is uh, to be launched in the plan uh, next year. It's an, an, an upgrade of Asia Sat 4 which is getting old. Okay, that's, let's, talking, let's talk about something newer. Then something newer is to uh, do research and to uh, manufacture, manufacturing in space. Uh, this lists a number of experiments on this uh, Chinese uh, Shijian 10, uh, which has just returned after a 15 day, day uh, orbital uh, 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 course in space. It has done a lot of, uh, well, from this list, you can see what 
approximately what you can do, basically. You have, it has fluid physics experiments in uh, space. The fluid, will, there's no gravity, so, you know, uh, the uh, fluid drop, droplets will flow around, right? And that actually caused a big problem and important related to combustion. Okay, combustion is totally different. The one big problem of traveling to space and staying there and also interplanetary travel to Mars is fire safety. If you have fire there, you know, clearly you cannot pour water on, on the fire. <laughs> For water will not flow or, you know, go there and then cover it up and stop it. No, the flies are, I don't know, it's very hard to detect fire in, in the space environment because the lower pressure and without gravity. It's hard to, it's hard to detect, it's hard to get it out, get rid of it. It's very dangerous. So this is one big problem that people need to work on and uh, to do experiments. Uh, the conventional application, of course, of, uh, uh, this, is, this is similar to a space lab or uh, in the, some kind of lab in, uh, in the uh, International Space Station. Basically, you, you are doing this kind of experiment in a microgravity experiment. Microgravity means that the gravity in this, in the, uh, in this uh, capsule is, when it's in space, should be less than uh, one part in one million of the gravity on Earth. So with that kind of small gravity, the very different things happen. Uh, biology is another thing, radiation biology, you know, up in space, you know, you ex you're exposed and what happened, you know, you can, actually people have grown, uh, you know, fancy uh, seats, you know, they put some seat in space, they brought it back, See, some of the seats get, you know, the outgrown of the seats get better, <laughs> according to the, those people who are working on it. Uh, gravitational biology, you know, without gravity, well, you know, things could behave differently. Biotech, of course, you can, people are talking about manufacturing medicine, new medicines in space. Now, let me talk about gravitational biology a little bit. This is something I, I found quite interesting. This is the development of uh, mouse early mouse embryos in space. That has nev never been done by uh, other experiments, not by the US, not by, in, not by Europe. This is something really new in this ch Chinese uh, uh, experiment. Uh, you can see that uh, you know, uh, the cells got uh, really split, and actually they, f they have followed it further, and it's really growing. Now, Okay, now, this is the main thing I would like to, well, I don't have five, four minutes, but actually this is the most interesting thing. I think people can really do something in terms of uh, getting into a uh, new business. First of all, what's the, uh, let's take a look what, uh, what we can do currently. A few years ago, uh, you are talking, well, 2014 on the left here. This is a Spanish uh, uh, Earth observing optical uh, frequency satellite, which has a resolution about one meter. Okay. Uh, one, a one meter, res this is to look at the uh, uh, Olympic Stadium in Beijing. One meter looks like this. 2015, uh, this is Korean satellite. It has a 0.4 meter resolution and the uh, stadium looks like this already. And uh, the new World View 4, of course, before that, that's World View 3 and 2 and so on, okay? This is the latest version of the World View series. Has a 0.3 meter resolution. This is commercial, this is not military. Military can, of course, do a lot more, right? Uh, which can look, you can see all these details uh, inside the uh, uh, stadium. Okay, so that's the current, basically what commercially was available now, they are on the meter and sub-meter level. Now, if you want to do business nowadays, it's not possible 
to, you know, uh, take China into account <laughs> in Hong Kong, <laughs> especially. And uh, this, uh, China has already take the uh, uh, remote sensing as a, an important uh, national policy. And actually, it has started doing, starting from about two years ago. When China determined to do something, you can be sure that you know, oh, it can move very fast. And they have already started this. Uh, basically, the uh, 13 five years science and technology innovation plan, okay, says that it's going to build and uh, work on this, uh, participate in this global Earth observation system of systems. What is system of systems? Global observation, there are a lot of systems. Uh, you can have different s satellites, different constellation of satellites looking at the, surf, uh, at, the, uh, uh, at the Earth in different frequencies, in different resolutions, different interests, different objectives. But they are looking at different things. The different things are the, the different systems. System of systems is to combine all this together into one big system. So this one big system, they give you an entry, and well, maybe you go through it and you can see all these results from all the systems together. Of course, this is a big uh, uh, IT, you know, <laughs> undertaking, as well as, of course, uh, in uh, uh, remote sensing techniques involved. Uh, okay, the Chinese has already done it. I, I already said uh, it has launched a number of satellites, a series of satellites called the uh, uh, Gaofen, Gaofen High Resolution Series. Uh, the objective is to have to have uh, nine satellites in total, in which will be completed in. Uh, 2000, before 2000, year 2000, and uh, so far it has launched uh, already five, okay? And this one, uh, Gaofen 3, is not an optical satellite, it's a, uh, you can see it's a uh, radar. But this radar can look down and have a resolution of one meter, okay? It's to observe the sea, ocean as well as land, okay? Uh, one of the purpose is that it can detect uh, uh, warships. <laughs> okay? Uh, they, the one reason for radar, of course, is that you can see daytime and nighttime, right? It is active. You, you don't rely on sunlight. Okay, another impressive uh, undertaking, which has started already in uh, 2015, is this Jilin one satellite, uh, it, this, is uh, this is mainly optical, but the impressive thing is it's, it already launched four, and uh, this year is set to launch uh, 16 of it. In 2020, uh, it will have 60, and in 2030, it will have 138 satellites that will provide global, all-time, full-spectral observation of any point on Earth within 10 minutes. So anything basically can be tracked almost in real time. Now, something closer. Sunjun, our neighbor, is very fast, really serious in doing, trying to uh, do this uh, into the space business. It has launched uh, last year. Uh, this is uh, Shenzhen Kai, Kai Tor 1. Actually, it has two satellites. One is uh, a um, mini satellite, which uh, the weight is about uh, 110 kilogram. Another one is a nano satellite, which weighs only two kilograms. The important, the impressive thing is that this 110 kilogram uh, Shenzhen satellite, KT1A, is to test the use of uh, commodity com components in the satellite. Everything is, you know, industrial grade only. <laughs> They're not specially designed, specially made. They just pick it up from the shelf and put it there. Then try to see whether it works. And it works, okay? 
And of course, they want to you know, make sure that the company providing those commodity products are good. And they give uh, special recognitions to those companies. And those companies, of course, are, you know, are really you know, enthusiastic about doing that because this, this is the proof of the, of the quality. And this is a very motivative uh, uh, act uh, action. The uh, nanoset, uh, as you can see from this uh, logo, uh, our uh, Polytech, Polycity, Polytechnical uh, University has participated in that. Okay, so that's mainly uh, this, this is the main thing I want to say. And you can see that there are many, many new companies just in, just in, in terms of the geospatial uh, applications. There are many, many of them already. And, uh, well, and uh, so there are many, many possibilities. I'm, uh, my time's up. I'm not going to uh, say too much about this Alibaba <laughs> venture. <laughs> So thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chan, for sharing your expertise with us today. So I guess it's safe to say that space is no longer the next frontier as we're already commercializing it. Yeah, well, yeah. everybody can go up eventually. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, if I can keep you for one more second, I just wanted to um, have Mr. Oh. Huang present you with a certificate of thank appreciation. You. Okay, uh, apologies, we're running slightly late, but there will be a tea break after the next session, so please stay with us. Um, we would like to start the next session on how to leapfrog. There will be a chance for Q&A at the end, and as we mentioned at the beginning, there is a chance to win prizes, so please make sure you register your questions online. Uh, please welcome back to the stage Ian Huang, the chairman for the... In um, Cooperatives are innovative intellectuals. Thank you, Ian. Thank you. Uh, before I say anything, I'd like to uh, say that we have six Caltech alumni in our audience. So <laughs> it's very unusual. OK, uh, I've been wanting to talk about this uh, for many years. I'd like to share this with you. Okay, uh, Billy? Billy? Where did Billy go? You want to talk about this? Okay. Hi, guys. Um, it's me again. Um, so I think uh, Avil has uh, talked about this already. Uh, today, on, on the sessions where we have Q&A, um, we will be using a software uh, so you can submit your questions. Um, if you can take out your mobile phone and use your browser um, and connect to uh, slido.com and enter the event tag IBF 2016, there you can actually enter your questions as Ian was speaking. And at the end, when the Q&A come up, uh, he will be able to uh, answer them. And as uh, our MC mentioned, there will be a special prize for the best question for each of the Q&A sessions. So go ahead and enter your name. Make sure that we can identify you so you will be able to uh, get a prize. Thank you. OK, thank you. And the judge? of doing, uh, selecting who's, uh, which question is the best is our Dr. York Liu. Okay, I'll get started. It's okay, the, uh, this is a table of contents. We'll talk about the concept and the constraint, the key elements and interdependency. I'll give an example and then open uh, for Q&A. Okay, there are basically two kind of uh, innovation progressive or transitional, and then there's breakthrough or dis disruptive or radical, uh, and the way 
again, I'm saying all this is my opinion and my experience. Is uh, progressive innovation is for survival. Like iPhone 6 to iPhone 7 really is quite boring, but it's for survival. And since it's boring, in my opinion, so I wouldn't you know, talk about it that much. I'll talk about the focus is breakthrough innovation, particularly in this forum. Leapfrogging is an absolute and fundamental for breakthrough innovations. If you cannot even do this, so let's do, don't talk about breakthrough innovation or radical innovations. And it is not limited to products, organization, business models, and technologies. Now, the way I look at it, we must agree, we must identify and agree on what are their constraints. If we cannot agree on this, we cannot provide a solution. If you cannot even agree on the, on, on the, on the problem. Okay, the constraints are, first is the mindset, the commitment, the past commitment and the current commitment, the infrastructure, and the buy-in, and then the team. The mindset, we all want predict everything to be pre uh, predictable, and we want a maximum control, and because we want certainty. We want no surprises. That's normal. However, the new demands will give us new requirements and, ch and challenges, so it results in new principles. Now, commitments. We all live in the time dimension. Now, the reason I talk about this is one time I, uh, I was in, in a company, I was with in Palo Alto, and, uh, and a guy, uh, his name is uh, Dr. Wilhelm, uh, he refused to give a schedule. And he said he doesn't work in a time dimension. Now, Dr. Wilhelm was uh, a famous computer scientist. He was the father of the HP 3000 machines. And then he went on to be the director of Sun Labs, um, Sun, uh, Sun Microsystem lab, Laboratories. Uh, <coughs> but the fact is we live in the time dimensions. And everything we do in a, in a company, there is a project management. There is commitment that you have to make. You, when the commitments, the resource commitment, that in you try to minimize the internal dependency to get it done, but you try to maximize the external ex expectations. However, innovation comes in more unknown. There are new unknowns. So the, make your commitment very difficult to follow up on your commitments. Buy-in. Typical, you have to get. Typically, you have to get buy-in, and has to, because you need the team support. And all, very often, actually, in most cases, the best solution is not the best solution. The best solution is the buy-in solution. What this means is you have a mediocre solution. Buy-in is really not absolutely necessary if you have a good leader. For example, Steve Jobs, he never really do buy-in, he do it himself. And that's not the only one that I have met, you know, it's uh, not as loud as that's all. So is buy-in necessary? At what stage? Talents. Uh, we all, Try to, not necessarily get the best talent, but trying to get the people that you know, or you know for many years, you are very comfortable with, and you know what, what they can do, what they cannot do. Now, this is actually, it narrows you. The way that you look for talents is that what is his exposure? 
And as a leader, you must be able to identify talents quickly and accurately. You cannot say, I have to know this guy for so many years, or he's my relative, or he's my brother, or he's my sister, or whatever, brother-in-law. You, you narrow your uh, networks, and you actually, you limit your thinking. Now, in, in my opinion, there are two things is important in leapfrogging. One is leadership. The second one is diversity with inclusion, and I'll elaborate on that. Leadership, one, you have to be foresighted with relevant exposure, and this is very important. And um, let me give you uh, not a, a generic example, but not a specific example, uh, without mentioning names. Uh, it was in Singapore, and I talked to the person that was in charge of the, uh, their technology and investment and all those things. And they used to really like the, the, the head of their local Singapore branch. The big company, head of the, the big company in Singapore. Now, those guys are undoubtedly well-educated and very intelligent. The issue is because Singapore is a small country and their revenue is limited, therefore, they will not participate in any global decision of the company. And they won't even get to sit in into, into those meetings. And therefore, their exposure is limited. They must be able to see the bigger picture and the trend. This is the only way that I know of you can define and identify the target. Now, competency. For the things you do, you have to have at least one area the leader must have core competency. If he has none, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it later. It actually is bad for the company, bad for the, uh, 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 like uh, you might not aware of this, General Electric, they used to make mainframe computers. And it was not doing too well, so they promoted a guy running the light bulb division to run their computer division. You know? And of course, the result is to sell it to Honey Honeywell. Another thing is for leadership, you must have peer support and you have track record to prove it because only that you can gain the respect of your peers. So you, you don't need the necessary buy-in. Now project management, the guy has to know some project management. He has to understand it is, you know, in order to manage any project, you must minimize dependency, not maximize de dependency. And I see many of them happening is that they maximize the dependency. And I guarantee you, it will never happen. Whatever they claim, it will never happen. You have to be fair. I'll, I'll talk about this hero syndrome in better detail. And also the business experience prefer Now, the hero syndrome. Hero is, is necessary and it's good up to a point because product in the past, the very successful product in the past does not mean success in the future. It actually maybe even is a liability in the future. But most of the executive management, the reason they get to that position is because of their past achievement. They, they make something happen. Now, I come back. It's difficult for those executive managements to realize their once successful baby are no longer wanted. They just cannot. Uh, they're very intelligent men. I have met quite a few of them, but they just cannot change. They still think, I have done this, and it 
It's a huge, hugely successful, so we should continue to do it this way. Examples. Mobile computing versus desktop computing. We all know what happened to Intel and Microsoft, and we all can look at Qualcomm, ARM, and Google. Not working. Okay, now why business experience preferred but not actually demanded? I'm very proud to say we can see technologies, technologists convert and transit to become a businessman. You never see it the other way around. Have you seen anyone, any, 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 I've never seen it. If the core competency is not related, the, the, the leadership of the core competency is not related to that business model, then really has a problem. For example, look at Silicon Graphics. Jim Clark, and then later uh, Richard. And what happened? Silicon Graphics is gone. Hewlett Packard, we all know what happened there. Hewlett Packard today is a inkjet printer accessories company. Accessories company. Very different from the day of the, the glory day of Hewlett Packard. They lost it all together. IBM. Gerstner saved IBM, no question about it, but also he also killed IBM because uh, no, there's nothing else anymore. You have anything creative and innovative and breakthrough come from IBM after Gerstner? Qualcomm, look at Qualcomm. It's true that one is the father, one is the son. But both are PhD in uh, double year, a technical person. So leaders with only business experience without core competency on, on the, of the strength of the company cannot sustain the advantage in innovation. OK, the innovation flow. Uh, something's missing here. Uh, there should be a big circle over it. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that the background is di exposure and diversity with inclusion. Diversity without inclusion is worse. Diversity is the source. Inclusion is integrate all the different opinions, different approaches, different culture, and together. And Innovation is first by ob observation. You must have the exposure. Like the space, the reason I talk about the space program is because most of today's startup, their thinking is apps. Apps has the problem is how do you sustain the innovation? Because if you are successful, slowly, I mean, just a little bit successful, there will be copycat. And the big company will come in and they own the channels, the distribution ch channels. They can crush you. They can buy you or they can crush you. And they can buy you and throw you away as well. So there's discipline as to how to manage the project. And then they realize it and go back to, uh, to testing. And it's a constant loop. Now, the innovation must be sustainable and repeatable. Technology innovation is not the only innovation, class of innovation. You have business, you have accounting, even you have legal innovations. But sustaining it, because you will have competitive, you will have competitions. And your the one that you the thing you innovated will age. It's not a forever thing. So you need continued innovation. Now technology innovation in con continued Continued technology innovation is already very difficult. But for business, it's almost impossible. I give you a specific example. 
Uh, we all know the Sloan School's management of MIT. They come from a gentleman called who, who, who innovated this car distribution systems. Can that be changed? Because the problem is, once the business infrastructure is established, it's more and more, it's almost impossible to change it, unless go through a nuclear thermal war, wipe out the civilization, uh, civilization, and restart it again. And this come from my old professor Gordon Bell always say that uh, this thing is uh, this infrastructure is so bad, and the only way to to change it is have a global war and a thermal nu nuclear war and wipe out all this, and we, we can start all over again. <clears throat> so, the sad truth is, my opinion, is for technology innovation is the only one allows you to sustain and repeat that innovation. And that itself is very difficult. Okay, the inter interdependency. Uh, the starting point is in the middle. But if you don't have the other support, you really cannot do the breakthrough innovation. You have to know the technology base, what are the emerging and what are the enabling. Uh, you have to have a core team. And you have to have some real world application, real world business needs. And then you understand that you can see the future lifestyle, what are the need, and how much people are willing to pay for it. You have all this knowledge, observations, then you can start, then you can do the leapfrogging, then you can do the uh, breakthrough. So, unfortunately, today, they all just go for the top one, the, 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 uh, the apps, and then they think they can do it. So, whatever they do is, cannot sustain the innovation. People, can, once you are just mildly successful, there will be copycats. And if you are getting better, there will be big copycat. Example, iPhone and iPad. Because this is popular, there are others. If you don't have the Microsoft processor bandwidth, you don't have the fresh memory, you don't have the display technology or the touch technology, and uh, the static discharge actually there's a touch technology, and the software, you cannot do it. And there were example failure before, like the grid computer and the Apple Newton. Then you look at the other side is the uh, the future lifestyle is the integrating the voice, data, and video communications. It has to be handheld, has to be af affordable. So you look at all this as how it comes about. Oops. I don't know what's going on. All right, so now is the uh, thank you and it's Q&A. Uh, Billy. Again, I encourage you to raise questions and relevant but tough questions. Uh, the tougher you got, then you'll get the price of two bottles of wine. Now, if you don't disclose your name, of course, now then you won't be able to get the, the price. Because I don't know how to identify you. Uh, I have not seen any innovations that can benefit the SME in Hong Kong, which are 
which innovation can be used in that area? Now, this is a, I'm sorry, this is a specific question. Um, You know, you know, I have uh, gone to a few uh, pitch, uh, those VC pitch in Hong Kong, and I'm sorry, it's quite disappointing because uh, as a businessman, we look at when are you going to break, break, break even and how much money you need and how you're going to spend the money and all those things. They, 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 they don't talk about those things. They talk about something else. They talk about things that are... so. By the time when you, after they talk about things that are not relevant, like how difficult their childhood is and, and things like this, and uh, already I lost my uh, focus. My, my, my attention span is gone. And so which innovation can be used in that area? To be honest, I have, uh, you know, I don't know if I can answer that question because it's, uh, it's a specific question. Fear of the future is an inhabitant of innovation. How do we encourage a culture that embraces failure as a necessary part of the process? I think um, the first thing is the, uh, the government has to change some of the laws. Um, for example, in the US and in Canada, that the bank can only blacklist you for five years, and they have to erase the record. That's the law. In Hong Kong, the bank can keep your can blacklist you forever. Now, what, why is this important? A 25 years young man or young ladies, he went to do she or he went to do a startup, and he borrowed the money from his parents, from his brothers, sisters classmates, schoolmates, friends, and was not successful. He failed. So he, the bank, not, not bankruptcy, just delay payment or skip payment or whatever. So what happened is the bank will blacklist him for life. And then his brothers, his sisters, his parents will still talk to him, but his classmates, his schoolmates, his uh, friends will avoid him because afraid of him coming back to borrow some more money. Uh, this is, uh, so what is a 25 years old young man going to do, or young lady? He's in deep trouble. He's, he's, he's uh, you know, he cannot buy a car. He cannot buy an apartment or house. Uh, he might not even get a credit card. How is he going to live? So the first thing is, the, the, the Hong Kong MA should do something about it. But, but, the, but the, the bank will come back, and I talk to some banks, and they come back and say, we are, we can, we have, it's freedom. Freedom of choice to do business. This is their reason. They have the freedom to pick who they, who they want to do business with. Is that a real reason? When you are a public service company, you don't have that, you don't have that freedom in my opinion. That's why US and Canada don't have that. This allow that. So um, there, there are many things like this. Okay. Uh, investing in leapfrogging innovations require a lot of resources and, and even larger appetites for risks. It's just hard to do in Hong Kong. Uh, Yes, unfortunately. Now, this is the difference. The VCs in, Hong, in, in, in Silicon Valley and in China, their background are engineers or lawyers that have spent most of their life in the technology industry. They look at some of the proposal. I'm sorry to say that we don't find it that risky. We know exactly what they're doing. Not exactly. We know what they're doing, and we believe that will happen. So to us, it's not that risky. 
but for an accountant, that's totally ridiculous. For an ex-banker, they just you know, cannot, they think this is highly risky, but to us it's really not that risky. I know exactly writing this piece of software, maybe it's a six months, two person, full time, can get it done. So to me, it's not risky. It's just getting, just a getting, getting it done. It's just like driving from here to there. So this is the problem, is the infrastructure is the, is, is, is the issue. I, I'm that, uh, I, by the way, I'm very frank and uh, hope uh, won't be taken uh, or mis misunderstood in any other way. How do you judge if a startup team will likely succeed? I look at the, the team um, and their background. If, if the team leader have the exposure, um, has, the, has the knowledge, and has the commitment to take to bear all the you know, all the difficulties and, and torrents. So it's really based on the team. And is the team cohesive? Can they really work together? If you don't have a team, just one or two person, that makes it uh, for the late round investor, that won't happen. For the angel investor, that means they have to babysit you. And and that takes a lot of time and resources. Watson is one of the biggest innovation in in uh, IBM recently. Uh, they are exploring to solve problems in medicine. Gerstner has turned IBM into a service company. Uh, is that a question or uh, a statement? The way I look at Watson, okay, it's a me too. Everybody doing similar things. You might have different name, different packaging, but it's the same thing. He has a lot of competitors. And they are not the biggest in this field. Uh, who should be the source of the innovation ideas? The market or ourselves or both? I think ourselves come first. Market comes second. Because when you first innovate or first come up with the breakthrough innovation concept, you cannot ask, you cannot be restricted by the market. You have to test the market. After you come up with the so called the solution, you have to test the market and come back and make modification. So for breakthrough innovation, you cannot have a product definition. Uh, you have cannot frozen it in day one. That becomes a project management activities, not an innovation process. That, that is, so actually, the, 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 the progressive or the transitional innovation is, um, is mainly is a project management experience. It's not an innovation process, in my opinion. What sectors benefit more from the cross-disciplinary dis, dis, uh, uh, knowledge or versus expert domain expertise? How should the VC investments? Well, okay, this is a this is a tough question. <laughs> uh, The v, okay, let's start, uh, the VC in investment strategy. I cannot speak for everybody, and, and each VC has its own uh, approach and style, and uh, I can only speak for myself and also some of the VC that I'm uh, in very good relationship with. Um, I cannot speak for uh, many of them. Really, it's the people. Do they have the uh, competency, the leadership, the exposure? 
to, and also the, the torrents, can they take the stress? Because some of them cannot take the stress. You have to take the stress. It's very stressful. That's why I, I didn't want to do another startup after I, I did two. To me, the most stressful in a startup is after you have 100 employees or 150, 150 employees, you have to pay them every two weeks or a month on time. If you borrow somebody's money, you can return it a day late, no problem. Or two days late, no problem. But for salary, you cannot do one day late. If you do one day late, your team will eventually dissolve or go away. So the, the larger you have, my experience is, and then because some of the employee, they live paycheck by paycheck. So their whole family, if you don't give them pay, ask them whatever, they may not be able to put food on the table. So your family becomes not only you and your children, but all your employees' family. And this, to me, was the most stressful one. Okay? You have to figure out the, the, the payroll and to pay on time. It must be on time. If you're one day late, slowly the team will dissolve. The, the Chengdu government pay 100% of innovative startup IP costs. Do you think this is a useful incentive program? Does Hong Kong have this uh, incentive? Well, Hong Kong, I understand uh, Hong Kong, you, you can apply for $140,000 Hong Kong to get, to get an IP from the uh, Hong Kong uh, H HKPC. But it's a one-time, lifetime application. Um, my opinion on IP, okay, I, I, I think I said about, I, I talked about this before, is that if you're a startup, you should pedal as fast as you can to become profitable. Don't spend the money where to build your support system. IP, in a way, is your support system. So you pedal as fast as possible to get to, to, get to uh, profitable. That should be your main goal. Uh, if, 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 if you can find a people that can write uh, your application uh, free, or maybe in, in, in terms of stock, not charging you, uh, that's fine. But you still have to spend manpower with that person to, 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 to write the article. So, so, so where do you put your resources? So I, I, I think uh, I have very good friends that are IP, uh, IP lawyers and IP agents. Uh, I, I don't mean to uh, undermine them. It's important. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have any uh, uh, patents because the the uh, thing I, got, I went through is uh, the company wanted to make it a standard, so no IP. <laughs> How is your comment about Facebook's founder? He has no, okay. Now, there are a bunch of people that have no degrees and become very successful. Mark is not the only one. We have uh, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs is actually worse. He got kicked out of UC Berkeley and never allowed him to return. Now, for UC Berkeley, such a liberal school, don't let, hi don't, don't let him return. He must have done something really wrong, really bad. We, we don't know what, okay? But... <laughs> For UC Berkeley, come on, it's the, it's the most liberal college in the world. Uh, now, we have to look at who are the mentors. Let's come back to the mentors. Bill Gates, his mentor is his father. His father taught him how to do business, and he was natural to be a business. He can play poker very well. So he's a natural businessman. <laughs> no facial e expression, okay? Uh, <laughs> Steve Jobs Steve, Steve Job, uh, has many mentors, but the most uh, important one to him was probably uh, 
uh, Regis, Regis McKenna is probably the, uh, Steve Jobs is the exact duplicate of him, okay, marketing expert, uh, charismatic, and, and uh, you, can, you can talk really well. So it's the mentor, and, and not so different from Mark, it's also because his exposure. So this, this, this part comes is his exposure. The mentor give you different, a different mentor give you different exposure at different stage of your life. Can you talk about deep training for innovation? What kind of funding resources and format and strength can benefit Hong Kong given its present situation? It is very hard. Uh, Because many, because this involves politics, uh, you have to say the politically correct things. Otherwise, uh, like for example, I have talked to some of you guys here. I am not a supporter of the fintech, the, uh, the blockchain technology. And here's my reason. First of all, the technology has not been defined and doing all the marketing already. So it's reversed. Usually you get some, something concrete, is, know it's working before you do the marketing, before you tell the world. But now, so the number one problem with, with this kind of approach, you maximize the dependency instead of minimize the dependency. Because the more things you claim you can do, it becomes, you maximize your dependency. Number two. Let's go back to the foundation of computer science, graph theory. Graph theory is the basic principle of computer communications. Can you do modular design? This is what they claim. The answer is no. In a computer communication environment, graph theory has taught us you cannot do modular design. And this is going against the fundamental of computer networking. Now, uh, but I, you know, I, I don't know how they, some of the technical problem, I don't know how they're gonna solve in accordance to what they claim in the market. If they haven't made that claim, that's different. But since they have made that claim, I seriously doubt it. But now, it becomes a force that everybody wants it. And I'm not sure, I'm high on conspiracy theory. I'm not sure is if this is a diversion, is a diversion of resources for the Asian countries. i give you an example. Japan going to the fifth generation computer. And we all know it failed. It failed miserably. And US encouraged them. And the result of that failure, not just failing the money and all those things, it lost two generations of their computer talents. This is a way to divert resources of another country to go into the black hole. Uh, I'm just uh, giving an example of what happened to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Japan, the fifth com computer uh, generation uh, effort. Uh, it sounds really uh, radical, I guess, to many of you. Uh, but really, I, you know, the same with the smart city. Smart city is also based on computer networking. But you have so many different applications, and more and more. And they, it's generate a big momentum. But you're making promises on the thing that hasn't worked yet. And you're making promises. Because when you make all these promises, you maximize your dependency. And this is completely contrary to any project management basic principle. Minimize dependency. So, so we'll see if it's a white elephant. What should Hong Kong work on to make Hong Kong successful? I think the, if you look at the history of, of, uh, of Sinju, of Silicon Valley, or Singapore, 
uh, even Japan and Korean, Korean is, is getting better. It, I mean, from technology point of view, is you have to build your core competency. The big trendy word is very attractive. And you can generate a lot of momentum, mirage. You can generate a lot of mirage, but is it real? And you was, the, the problem with this kind of thing is it looks very good, it sounds very good, but when you fail, it didn't happen and didn't deliver. What is that? It will make the government more, more hesitate for the next idea. And you will also waste generations of talents. And this is the, actually, the, the second one is more harmful. You're hurting the younger generation and it follow on. And we all have obligation to our younger generations. That's why I'm here. Uh, okay, I think uh, that's it. And so Thank is you. the. Thank you for doctor. sharing your tips on how to leapfrog into success. I would now like to welcome to stage Dr. Raymond Ho. Ian, if you could stay there for a second. Uh, to present the certificate of appreciation to Ian. So, Dr. Raymond Ho, please. Thank you, gentlemen. So now we have time for a quick tea break. So please go and uh, have some refreshments and come back in 15 minutes, 11.45. Thank you very much.